Hi, Simon. Hi. How's it going? Great. How are you? Good. Can everyone hear us? Yes. Um, we're sorry your brother Nikki couldn't join us, but he's had some health issues, but he's okay. So we wish him well. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always like to start out with a little art history. So I picked some things that I don't think influenced you, but which I see as ancestors, perhaps, to some of your works. Um, Fantastic Creatures is one category in which the, that you all address, and there's this amazing sculpture in um, the Metropolitan Museum that's usually up by um, this French artist into the 19th century that's a chimera. And of course, chimeras and dragons and unicorns and all kinds of weird monsters have had a long history in the history of art. But I think what's interesting is that the artist who, at least in this case, this artist also has this really strong sensitivity to materials. And so I think the combination of that and your work is, is really um, interesting. And another one, this is a really weird one that's actually in, not by a well-known artist at all. Um, we used to call it Yoda when I, I worked at LACMA um, <laughs> after they acquired this and it's by, um, but it's this really interesting, strange looking hybrid creature of a, sort of the sort of gnome-like that relates to this era of fantasy, also in ceramic. But of course, I think the real thing that I thought of with your work is, is Gaudi's amazing Park Güell in Barcelona, which of course is made with broken tiles and it's sort of a fantastic lizard and I think there's many parallels to your work. Do you know the work of Gaudi well? I'm obsessed with Gaudi. No, that's good. I picked the right slide then. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, particularly because uh, my brother and I work in uh, a very, I'm more uh, scientific, mathematical, surface oriented. Uh, and he's very much about the forms and the animalistic side. And I think Gaudi actually was the two of us combined, uh, and we have to come together in order to do stuff like mm -hmm. that. But um, when I see Gaudi, particularly at um, uh, the La Sagrada Familia, his, the way he hung his model upside down with sandbags is more kind of how I think. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then the, like, the lizard, for example, is much more my brother. Right. How did you, why don't you tell us how you and your brother came to work together as artists, designers, we won't even worry about the categories because they're, uh, who cares well, about categories? I was a struggling painter uh -huh. uh, and I had studied architecture also, so I had a background in some of it and my brother was a house manager um, and he, uh, he was commissioned just to make a few very basic furniture pieces uh, and he asked me to do CAD drawings for him. Uh, and then we decided to, to work together. And I did it kind of begrudgingly, actually, um, because I wanted to keep on painting and, uh, and cooking also. Um, but uh, it worked out, so <laughs> I'm glad that I agreed to do it. Um, but it really started out sort of as cabinetry manufacturer, and very quickly, I think both of us couldn't uh, just do that. It's not, it's not in our nature to just make a, a square working cabinet. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, what, um, when did you first sort of realize that you could have a go of this together as brothers like working collaboratively? Uh, we, we talked about it in 2009. I mean, really, we've been working together since we were kids. Um, and, you know, we would build tree houses together. We used to carve stone together because my dad was a stonemason. Um, and an artist, and, too. And, and an artist, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so the two of us were always doing projects together. Uh, we parted ways when I went to school. And then when we wound up in LA, it just kind of happened naturally. And that was uh, about 10 years ago? Yeah, it was in 2000, 2010s when we uh, officially recent. formed. Yeah, I know, kind of recent. Yeah, that's pretty it recent. Still it's still feels new. <laughs> Can you talk, so your dad's an artist. You guys are both into music, just really seriously, I know. Yeah. And you grew up, from what I know, in this fa fairly interesting milieu in Austin around artists, filmmakers. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, well, my mom was an opera singer and a screenwriter, and she was living in LA um, of, right up until we were very young uh, as a screenwriter. So she knew all kinds of really interesting people, uh, and my older brother is an actor, and he also did. So we kind of grew up in a house where, I don't know if anyone knows Philip Mall, but he's a concert pianist. He was like playing piano in our house. And then I called Terrence Malick Uncle Terry, for example, which is really yeah, that's crazy. Because yeah. yeah. later on, I became a fan of his films. I had no idea. Right. Um, and so, so he we, was around a lot when you were going? Yeah, we were yeah. surrounded by like yeah. really uh, crazy people. Yeah. Um, and so I think we just grew up with that uh, as, our, as our guide, basically. And our mom was singing opera. My dad painted. Uh, nobody knew how to do anything financial, anything responsible <laughs> at all, and I'm still kind of figuring that out, but it's like, uh, uh, yeah, we, we were pretty fluent in how to be expressive. 
But your brother wanted to be a hockey player, if I yeah. have that correct. And he did play hockey. And then you want, you wanted to be a painter. Well, right? it's funny. He was the rebel by trying uh, to do uh, sports and, uh, <laughs> and like right. hold down a job, basically. Uh, so he, he was being rebellious by, by being a hockey player. Uh -huh. um, and he was really good at it. Yeah. Uh, and he played drums. And uh, I was just I was a cook and uh, and then tried to paint and that's like my that was uh, that was very very conservative for my family a very mm -hmm. like accepted thing to be doing Interesting. which is funny I think it's I have noticed in my career in dealing with artists that. Many artists are great cooks. It's interesting, and it's. I think it's because they know how to make stuff with their hands. And it's yeah. also a lot of art is about transformation, and that's just sort of what cooking is. I think it's just a sensitivity to. Um, I mean, art is a, com a, a combination of observation and and being able to just uh, translate something through your fingers. I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, one of my. If I have a skill that I'll that I would talk about, it's the ability to like feel stuff with my fingertips and manipulate things. Uh, so um, and also to observe. So I think if if I anything that has to do with that, I can uh, I can kind of at least get kind of good at. And so that manifests itself early in your life as cooking, most of the fingertip thing. Yeah, exactly. I, can, I think I understand what you mean really well. Yeah, like yeah. knife work. I mean, if you watch a sushi, yeah. sushi chef, For they're sure. incredible with their yeah. knife. And that's yeah. that. Uh, I think a lot of it is learned, but they probably have kind of a predisposition to be able to do that also. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, and, and definitely for me, it's I, I love to like feel stuff and uh, like I love beadwork. Yeah, we're gonna. We'll one of my to favorite that. things. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to just do show one more slide that I, of art history. It's not really. It's pop culture history, but like surely Dr. Seuss. Uh -huh. And you knew all about this when I put this up. So maybe you can talk about these. A little uh, bit. This, this. We this, all know Dr. Seuss, right? We, this we, book was really important to me. I, I think that uh, Oh, the places you'll go was important, and the Lorax. And I, the Lorax was my first understanding of um, deforestation and how sad that is. Um, and I just loved him. I loved that he's like a spirit of the woods. And um, I, you know, I think Nikki and I are kind of into animism, uh, just that each, everything has kind of a spirit anyway. Uh -huh. So he's like a really good, uh, he was my first understanding of that. Um, plus the, the truffula tree tops just Is that, are What are they called? Truffula trees. Oh, okay. I think so. Does anybody want to correct me on that? I think Do you that's feel what they're like called. that just seeped into your unconscious, or in, and it all comes out in your work now? Yeah, probably. probably. Yeah, I mean, I'm just there. There are very striking. Not that it's you're, you know, you're not copying him, but it's no, but it's it is really similar, and it's so weird. Like I, when I read, I, I have a nephew now who's a year and a half, and I read Dr. Seuss to him, and I just have no idea where he came up with his right. weird rhymes, and I mean, it's like dark, but also just. Incredible. He always throws in some darkness, which I think mm -hmm. makes it even more special. Yeah. Because um, it's it's real. Yeah. Um, but it's but it's really beautiful. And then this high keyed color palette is also very striking. It's pretty wacky. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> non naturalistic. I think we can say that yeah. for sure. Um, great. I wanted to. So now we'll show some of your work. Okay. I thought we could talk about the accretions. That I was there was a quest to ask specifically about this technique that you developed, and so and then this is also related to the work you're doing at the embassy in Niger. Yeah, exactly. Like right. So I think this is a great uh, example of when Nikki and I come together to make something because the shapes are entirely his, and I was the uh, materials researcher for this. How did he? How does he come up with the shapes? Does uh, he... Very sexual. Um, you know, he always says that he uh, has not had very many sexual partners, and I have, so I don't have to express it through my art. And he okay. expresses the. <laughs> so I'll speak for him and say that. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and um, I mean, you can see you can see the sexual forms, and we also name them uh, after. Uh, we say call them fathers and mothers, and there's there's certain. They're just very sex organic. Uh -huh. um, and also kind of underwater creature. Uh, he has a real talent for making an inanimate object feel like it's Alive. got some yeah, got yeah. something. Yeah, got exactly. Some Even if it doesn't reference something. Um, does he draw the form first before it's uh, he translated does, yeah. into three dimensions? Does yeah. he just draw with like pencil and yeah, now he uses an iPad because oh, I yeah. kind of forced him to. Because uh -huh. uh, otherwise, I have to, to do the archiving, uh, and I like it to be digital. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So, um, uh, but yeah, he he'll draw with anything. 
And right. his drawings look a lot like Dr. Seuss. They're very cartoony. Yeah. Uh, sometimes when we present a, a drawing to, um, to a client or, or like if we were doing a show presentation, it takes a big leap of faith on the, on the, pers- on the part of the other person to, uh, to let us do it. Because mm-hmm. um, it really looks like a cartoon uh, from yeah. the beginning. Right. So, so talk about the translation. So the, he comes up with the drawing and the form, and then you talk about your materials research for this technique. So this, this material, um, like I said, I'm just obsessed with touching stuff. And, and I, I also like to read about everything that, I've, um, that I'm interested in. So uh, as soon as I, as I started to work with clay, uh, I actually used to live in our studio, so I had the luxury of um, being there all night long when no one was around. <laughs> and I was just sitting there with some slip, which is very wet clay, um, and an old uh, like leather hard clay vessel that had been thrown by somebody else. And I sat there and I, um, I, was, I was just thinking, if I brush this forever, it's gonna do something. I know that it'll self-organize. Uh, like the clay will pack somehow, uh-huh. uh, but I didn't know what it was going to look like. Um, and uh, that just came kind of from observing how quickly dry clay uh, sucks up water. And I was uh-huh. like, I know that it's going to kind of attach to it. Um, and I was thinking about caves a lot at the time, and I wanted to make sort of a, a handmade cave structure, basically. Uh, so the first pieces didn't look like this. They, they just were a texture on on a very basic looking vessel. Um, But uh, I I continue to be really obsessed with self-organization and uh, and that literally Like the way nature might organize itself. Yeah, that every material has a way of packing. Right, uh, Uh like crystals or whatever. Yeah, there's always some way that stuff packs. Like spheres do it really perfectly, but if it's not a sphere, it's gonna do something really strange. Yeah, Yeah. Uh Um, so this, the way this is done is actually just uh, over and over a bottom to top brush onto a clay surface and thousands of layers later it has kind of grown these fingers. Um, which so is, it's literally a question of brushing thousands of times to, yeah, get the, exactly. to build that up. Yeah. And the shapes are completely determined by nature. I know the person is, it's like human aided cave growth basically. Um, and the inconsistencies in the person's uh, brush strokes will cause some things to happen, but they always kind of self-correct, which is interesting. Um, and the reason they're pointing down like that is that we brush bottom to top. If you brush bo- uh, top to bottom, they point oh, up. Oh, right. Have you uh, done ones that do that? Do yeah, but I like this. Oh, you prefer this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does it reach, I assume it reaches like a breaking point or for like There's a limit. Word. There's a limit yeah. to what you uh, It's can like do. an inch and a half is a limit. Okay. Um, these are pretty far out uh, in many ways. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's definitely a, a limit. I've done it with wax and there's no limit, but there's something about ceramic that the, the fact that it's so fragile and useless right. as, a, as, like a, as a vessel is also exciting to me. Do you just fire these once then? Uh, no, that, uh, these are fired three times. Three the times. Ones, well, the ones that have gold are fired three times. Um, Otherwise, we do two firings. Uh, okay. One's a bisque firing, and then, then we do a, a glaze fire. OK. And how many of these would you say you've made? Or do you? uh, I don't know. We make, it, dep- it go, depends year by year. They're all, they all look different, too. This collection is like a, a year and a half old, I think, or maybe two years old. Um, and the current ones look not as uh, Fantastic. So when you first started making these, were you doing them yourself? And then, yeah. you, so, so t- talk about like getting a studio practice developed with, with this. Because obviously to, to ramp up production, you have to have help. And yeah, exactly. And you're directing these, this technique that you developed yourself. Exactly. Um, yeah. So a lot of my processes are really crazy making. Um, and uh, like, like Nicky, if I teach him to do it, he, he stops after two hours. He can't, can't do it anymore. Right. Um, so you have very different temperaments that completely, way. Completely, yeah. 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 yeah and I'm, I sort of need that methodical. Yeah. thing I need to just be brushing clay. It's like, is it like something. zen-like for you? Is like meditation, yeah. sort of mindfulness? Yeah, yeah. otherwise yeah. I'm like right. going crazy. Uh, and <laughs> it's good you found this. I know. <laughs> now it's beads, so that's good. <laughs> right, okay. um, and they take even longer than this does. Uh, um, yeah, so I this process actually, I, uh, I taught it to uh, Roan Flores, who works in our studio, and she's now the only person who ever does it because she has the perfect hand and the perfect temper- temperament for doing it. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, 
I mean, honestly, if I were doing it for this long, I would also probably be tired of it, but she's obsessed. She really loves it. Uh -huh. And it's, it's interesting, um, not, not, anyone, not just anybody could get them to grow as long as they do. If you leave the brush on for too long, um, the brush will dry onto the, the petal or mm -hmm. whatever. Oh, I don't yeah. know what they're called, whatever petals. The uh, and it'll pull it right off. Uh -huh. um, and if you press too hard, they also break. So uh -huh. it's such a specific thing, and she's the expert. If it breaks, so, is there a way to fix it? Or do no. You have to, oh, so you have to do it, do it right. Yeah. yeah. It's all the technique, yeah. Yeah, and you can't really touch it afterwards either. So you feel like she can do it better than you can? <laughs> oh, for sure. I actually tried to do it again recently, and I, was, I wasn't so the good at it. The painter Marilyn Minter once told me, she's like, my, the people in my studio can paint better than I can. She's uh -huh. like, I invented, <laughs> I invented something, but then they can do it better. It's interesting. Yeah. So. Well, I'm interested in making a seed of something that doesn't require me to even exist exist anymore. Uh -huh. uh, like I, I want to I, I wanna have a process that is exactly the same as when I first made it, whether it doesn't, it, where it doesn't matter who's making that. Right. Now Nikki, on the other hand, it has to come directly from his hand. Um, and that's another way we're really different because um, mm -hmm. he's not so process oriented. Um, and his, his, physic, his like, what, I don't know what it is, his physicality is what makes our art have its spirit. Let's see. Okay, let's look at more images. These are more accretions, right? Mm -hmm. um, are these a different era? Uh, those are from the same sort of era as the, okay. the last set. And this is when we were trying to make them look like they were kind of popping these gold things out of them. Uh huh. Uh, very strange. I mean, that one has like almost a bird poop kind of. Right. A, uh, How did you, on. so clearly <laughs> texture is a real interest of yours and you guys experiment with all these different kinds of textures. Sometimes yeah. you contrast them, these mm -hmm. are clearly, you know, have, you know, but, and, and sometimes you come up with completely different materials like yeah. fur and leather and stuff like that. Yeah. I'll, let's skip the, so there's some more accretions, biomorphic. And nature, do you like look at natural forms or do you yeah, just Yeah, sort of, all yeah, the time. Yeah, like in nature or do you look at? Yeah, well, uh, I love, I mean, California is great because I can go to all kinds of different environments all the time. Right. Um, but I, I really zone out on, on like a leaf. You know, I'll sit there and look at the leaf for a long time. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I mean, you absorb it, I imagine, yeah. that way. Yeah. And I just wonder like how, you know, I was, I was in a cave actually in uh, the giant forest in California uh, about a year ago, and I was like, how does cave bacon form? I don't know if you guys know that, but it's like where, it's just like, it looks like bacon that's hanging oh, off, okay. the, off of a cave. Cave bacon. Yeah. I've never heard that term. <laughs> is that a real term? Look it up. It's so uh, cool. It sounds amazing. Uh, uh, I, I like really want to make <laughs> cave bacon. And I, I haven't figured it out yet, but. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure it will come. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I would have guessed the succulents are appealing, you know, cac cacti. Yeah, I things. love succulents. Uh, Do you go to the Huntington it's garden? so great. Yeah. Oh, it's so amazing. The cactus yeah, garden's yeah, great. It's incredible. Those those are great because they're so ordered. I mean, yes. they, and they look wacky, but they're still so ordered. I feel like if our artworks were um, a plant, it would definitely be a cactus. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Here's something different. This is pretty wild. So yeah, I was talking about uh, Nikki's sexual. What's this uh, called? Uh, this is we call it a mega beast. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> it's a big. Yeah, piece. Yeah, in many ways, <laughs> uh, and it's really big. Um, and uh, I mean, this one's interesting actually because we're we're known for our creatures, and this is the only time we've ever done something like this. And this is sort of, um, I mean, Nikki would say that we that the beasts are portraits of either people or kind of emotional states, mm -hmm. um, and they are they're very much about those gestures. If you look at this guy, he's a little cocky and. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended, I would say. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and he's imposing. Uh, and this, this came from a period in our studio where the two of us were kind of grappling with, um, with the quick success that we had. And I, like, I couldn't really handle it. And the two of us started fighting. And, I, and, uh, and we had... Because it was just 10 years ago. It was like, that yeah. is fast. I mean, it was I, fast, I imagine. yeah. I mean, um, that's not and, that long ago. Uh, I actually uh, like walked out of the studio halfway through this one, which was crazy. Uh -huh. But so we we were like really fighting, and I think that we were we were having an issue with our own egos, and this uh -huh. sort of has come to represent um, a manifestation of our ego, uh, actually, to both of us. Um, I mean, interestingly, it has a somewhat classical pose. I mean, uh -huh. from art history, you could yeah. see if it was a human, you could see it. 
you know, po- a naked model posing for yeah, you know, definitely Michelangelo. Or whatever. I mean, it's yeah, it's like a, it's an art pose, uh, but it's uh, when I look at it, I have I have like uh, almost pain flashbacks. So oh. it it really is a, an intense piece, um, but very much looks like the like all of our work. Um, but I think it's a good example of how much uh, emotional um, and sort of situational stuff goes into every object. And you know, as we keep going, the shapes morph, and they're a, a really um, accurate reflection of what our shared emotional state is. Um, yeah. So the the materials here, the contrast between the softness of the fur and the hardness of the metallic shiny brass, or I'm not sure what it is, um, is, is interesting to me. And that, that, that like gives these pieces in particular their, their character. Yeah. Um, it also sharpens, you know, it sharpens the genitalia, it sharpens the hands, it focuses the eye on these exactly. certain body parts. And, and yeah, I mean, there's no ignoring it. This thing is so confrontational. Yeah. Um, uh, even when I look at it, at it in front of people, sometimes I'm like, oh, no, I should right. be showing this. Right. Um, <laughs> well, because so. it uses a language that we're, you know, we're the, the soft, furry, you know, stuffed animal language is a child language, and then you have this very, you know, yeah. upfront, out there sexual part, too. Exactly. Has anyone ever criticized you for that? Or, uh, or? Yeah, I mean, people people are like, does it have to have a penis on right. it? Or like, why right. are you doing that? And right. I, I, but again, like that's, that's actually, um, I think it's just part of being human. And I was talking about Dr. Seuss's throwing twisted stuff in there. I, if we just ignored all of that, um, then we wouldn't be being honest about right. our work. Um, and I think that something interesting happens. It's, it's why, uh, I think it's why making furniture that isn't furniture is interesting too, is when you, when you jam two things into each other, um, or you know, if I take this glass and I say it's not a glass now, your mind starts going, well, what, what is it then? And I like that space. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like the sort of gray zone, um, or just a pairing of two things that shouldn't really be going together. How did you come up with this particular combination of materials? The, the uh, and are those parts cast? Like, like they're cast, lost yeah. wax cast? Uh, they are. They're lost wax. Yeah. Uh, the horns are ebony. Um, those are hand carved. They're just they're they're materials that you know. Nikki loves using bronze and ebony, uh, and and for him, wax is the best uh, sculpting medium. Mm-hmm. So we'll actually make a. Uh, a, a wax and then directly cast. So he it. sculpts in wax, like yeah. that's what he's working on. Yeah. yeah. So bronze is a great medium for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then our dad carves the horns, which is kind of cool because With what? He, our our father carves the horns. Oh out yeah. Of, okay. Oh yeah, out of yeah. ebony. Oh. Right, um, okay. And I think that's an interesting touch also because he he taught us how to carve and um, and we're I don't know for me it means a lot that every horn was made by my dad. That's nice. Yeah. Good. And how about the fur? The fur, uh, we just love that fur. It, I mean, it kind of looks like human fur. I it's mean, did a, you come up with the, that material like as a solution? No, to it's, this? An, it's an Icelandic sheep fur. Okay. Um, so it's it's all natural. None of this has like a, a materials twist from me at all. Um, but but we talk about like in, in that case the the conception of it is is sort of a conversation. And there's a good example of when Nikki physically makes the thing. Mm-hmm. Let's look at, uh, ah. here's some more. These are cuter, for sure. These are, uh, these are very appealing. <laughs> I mean, very like Star Wars. So you know. this, it's cool, it's funny to have talked about that other one first because um, what led us into making these objects in the first place was we were talking about the Uncanny Valley, which is, uh, if you don't know, it's about uh, robots actually where there's a robot upstairs who's a good example oh. of, of a robot that you want to interact with. But if you make a robot get too um, human-like, uh, your empathy kind of goes uh-huh. up, 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 and then as soon as it looks like a person, it goes down right. to like your empathy is like zombie level. Uh-huh. Um, and then if you make it cute, like give it big eyes, <laughs> it goes uh, way up uh-huh. uh, to above, uh, above human. Which is kind of incredible. Yeah. Um, and I was. That's called the about, Uncanny Valley. That's the Uncanny Valley. Yeah, the valley is the the zombie dip, basically that uh-huh. happens. Um, and it's true. And I actually was sort of equating it to um, uh, to taxidermy, which we grew up around. Oh, and my that's mom actually like loves taxidermy. Oh, well, that's and, but I explains find a it, lot, doesn't but, it? Yeah, but I find it super <laughs> creepy. Like if yeah, I'm in yeah. a room with it, I really Me don't too. like it. 
Yeah. And Nikki wanted to use this fur because he'd found it in Iceland in a gas station, and he was like, I need to use this fur. And I, I was like, but I think taxidermy is so creepy. And so we had this big conversation about it, and we thought, what if we don't include any facial features at all? Uh -huh. And we're allowed to use horns, uh -huh. and otherwise, it's just about the gesture. Yeah. Um, and so that's. And then we have to fill it in as a viewer in a way, like where might the which eyes? Which is yeah. great because yeah. that gives you space to project onto it. Uh, then you get to have a relationship with it immediately, uh, and I think that's kind of that's kind of a special thing. So when you s obviously in a museum context, we're not supposed to touch art, and uh, please don't. Um, but you, you sell these to private. Do, do you? And they're so touchable. Like, mm -hmm. do you, I mean, what do you think about that? Do you make them to be touched or in, and yeah. loved? Like well, I mean, we started off or? making furniture, so it was supposed to yeah. be used. Yeah. Uh, and I think less and less people are actually using it, but it mm -hmm. is meant to be lived with. And if you, right. you know, um, I've heard of them getting a uh, like a tongue bath by dogs, and they're still okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, well, they're probably pretty durable. On the they're whole. durable, yeah. yeah. yeah you they're just awesome. have to polish them up a little bit. Right. Um, when you you mentioned earlier, you, you when you the, when we were talking about the previous piece, you you had a fight with. Nikki, about yeah. that. Does that happen often? Is it hard? No, that was the really the only fight we ever had. Okay, right. Otherwise, it's smooth collaborating. You feel like? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we really respect each other. We we speak like we're, we're twins, so we just have a natural yeah. way of interacting with each other. And I know when he's going to do something better, and vice versa. And we just let each other run with it. That's great. And I, when we fought, I think that 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 sort of. Um, from birth, understanding faltered a little bit because uh -huh. we were both so overwhelmed. Right. Um, and luckily, I mean, I'm really grateful that we had a fight because I uh, we're back to like, you know, even pre-career happiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I can't think of any other twins who produce art together that I can think of in the history of art. I'm sure there I are, don't know. but uh, musicians, maybe. It's probably some, right? Yeah. yeah, there must be some. Oh, the Star Twins. Twins. Yeah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> I mean, if you can do it, I think it's really lucky. Yeah. There's oh, this one. guy. Yeah. Hi. This reminds me of like a creature from um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer that, uh -huh. you know, except it's got a big heart on, so you didn't see that. Um, <laughs> this was in the same period as that other, as the other big one, and, and you can see like putting lips on, et cetera, is, uh, was a departure from what I was just talking about. Uh -huh. um, and again, as soon as you start doing it, that, it adds an element of, of maybe creepy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, we were just kind of playing with how far we could push that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was still during this sort of turmoil period. Do you see them as gender fluid? Um, not this one. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, in general. Unless it's explicit, then right. I, I think you can assign whatever gender to it you want to. <laughs> <laughs> And then, so um, here's where we get to furniture, uh -huh. and, the, and, the, and they're a true like hybrid between sculpture and furniture. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, this one, um, this one, I think we named it Anna Nicole for some uh -huh. reason, oh. uh, and uh, oh. so it has a special place for me. I'm a, I like, I'm obsessed with her, and I, we, all of our names actually uh, are sort of funny. Uh -huh. um, uh, so, and our idea there is. If you don't like the piece, maybe you'll at least laugh at, at how stupid the name is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this was uh, a chaise, and it has big camel feet, and uh, it was pretty early. I can't say what year this was in, but I want to say like 2013, maybe. Uh, and this was us pushing from furniture into sculpture. So since we started as a cabinet company, right. Uh, we we had that was really our like basis for everything. Or it was our foundation, uh, and then so it started functionally. Like you really were completely. making functional things, like yeah. to sell to people to live with. Yeah. Very plain, very yeah. boring, uh, and uh, and then we just sort of let ourselves explore with it, and slowly it evolved into this. And and uh, I was always just really excited when you if you put an extra leg on a chair. It does something in my head. I mm -hmm. go like, "Why is that there?" Mm -hmm. um, and and that's right. all I want to do really is yeah. is create almost an, a visual analogy. Or we like visual jokes, visual metaphors, and visual analogies, uh, and just pushing something into where you have to start uh, like questioning something. I think this is interesting because it almost looks like it, it could be a real animal, like uh -huh. that you're like a llama or a yak or I don't know what, but something. I want to meet her. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
It does feel alive. It's really comfortable. Yeah, I bet. And, and the, are the horns <laughs> ebony? Those horns? The, Sorry? Um, are the horns ebony? Did your They're dad, ebony, yeah. Did your dad so my carved dad carved those, those oh. also. Nice. Oh, and then ah. I love this one because this is like a herd. This, and this is like tour de force to This me. was awesome. Because yeah. um, then this also uses a, everything but the, you know, it's got metal. It's got uh -huh. the, the, the hexagonal tiles. Yes. Yeah, so the table is made from, from individual hexagonal tiles. They're all like three quarters of an inch. They're not very big and they look like a sort of a generic um, hex tile bathroom floor, uh, except they are made out of solid brass, and we hammer each one of them into a shape to sort of fit onto a surface, and then grind them and miter them. It That's takes, just insane. Oh, yeah. it's nuts. It's, it it takes insane. like 20, 30 minutes yeah. to do one tile. Yeah. And what's great is that you don't see that they're tiles if, unless right. you get up close flush. to it. Because they're flush. Yeah. There's no grout. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's like, why don't you just cast it in bronze? And no, I actually really love the confusion there. Uh -huh. uh, and I like that uh, the, that process is in particular is about Nikki doing something very quick and then spending forever on cladding it. Uh, mm -hmm. so, he, so the shape he comes up with quickly, the table yeah, he shape. Just yeah. sculpts it very quickly and then we apply my process to it and it's like, uh, I, I don't know why I like that so much, but I just really, really like it. And with this set, we wanted to have a, a dining table that looks um, that's being used whether someone's at it or not. Uh, so the, the animals are all eating <laughs> so at it. It's very inviting. I want to have um, a dinner party at this table. I, I know, sure. it would be fun. Oh and, and also, just considering the human element of, of having dinner, is, it is, I hope that it's fun and, or that jokes are made. Um, and that there's good icebreakers, and really, like, if I sit down, I hope that it's a crazy table like this so that I immediately have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, or I can talk to the chair across from me. <laughs> um. <laughs> how does it come up again with how you make the tiles form to the curved surface? Yeah. So that's like, it seems like a technical uh, tour de force. It's super to me. hard. Yeah. So, uh, and actually. And I've actually felt one of these in your studio a stool, and I was like kind of amazed by they're, the whole, they're, they're pretty Because it's so crazy. smooth. But you could see the, you know, the shape. And we really don't make very many of these because they take so long. I can imagine. Um, and I used to make them all uh, by myself. They're, like this was, I, I don't know how, why I was doing this. I would actually wake up um, in my bed and have uh, patinaed sheets. Like I had been sweating out brass, which is <laughs> terrible, um, because I was grinding them all the time. Wow. And, um, but I studied some blacksmithing at school, so I was kind of good at forming metal. Um, and I was obsessed with hexagons because they don't like to bend. Uh, they're the most efficient. I think you get the most surface area with the least um, outer area. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, so of any regular I'm not shape. Good math, but yeah. uh, and it's also the, the most rigid of any regular shaped grid. Um, and bees use them. I think this is why bees uh, uh, use hexagons yeah, yeah. because uh, there's less wax and more space uh -huh. inside. They're very efficient. Yeah, sense. they're efficient yeah. shapes, so I'm like all about them. Right. And uh, did you just discover that by reading about? Yeah, I was like googling yeah. hexagons, yeah. and uh, and I and I read that they don't like that the grids can't bend, and I was like, I'm gonna bend <laughs> some hexagons. <laughs> <laughs> and so this it turns great. out to be really hard. <laughs> And, you did it. Uh, yeah, and so I basically, I, I um, you know, we have a, a system where you, you take a piece of paper and kind of draw where you think it's going to go, and then you hammer it until it fits. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you'll never find... So a lot of it's like done on, like, while you're making the piece, like, just, just all the little the hammering of it's the all thing done to make it way. fit together. Yeah. You start with one, and you have to right, move in concentric right. circles right, right, out uh, from that one. Right, if you right, move... Right two together, you'll never, there right. will never be a good right. seam. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, it literally has to like grow over the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and there are never any that are below, except on very early pieces. I don't like squares in it, so no squares. Pentagon is okay. Uh, and then a, a, and like seven, sometimes eight-sided pieces wow. are okay. okay. Oh, I love this one too, because yeah. this one's like more table than animal, but it's yeah. still very animal. Uh, so um, this is, um, we made this at Anderson Ranch, I think, in Aspen. What kind uh, of wood is it? Uh, it's walnut. Okay. And it is, uh, it's all hand-carved walnut. Did Nikki carve it himself? Yeah, so yeah. same visual language without uh -huh. that process on it. Uh -huh. um, and uh, again, just kind of like goofy stances. Uh, 
Actually, the stools are, I sit on them sometimes and fall over. They're not really good for that. <laughs> Is that uh, right? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but just the feet of the, of the chairs are feet, uh, but they look like Smurf feet. And uh, again, these really do feel animated. Cute I mean, and, just, yeah, exactly. They absolutely do. To that's me. the whole just, point. And that's really my brother's magic. talent is like, yeah. I, I could never reach that. I try and I never am able to uh -huh. make something feel like. Uh, but Nikki can do it. That's yes, his, yeah, exactly. That's his it's great. I love uh, this. This is amazing. Yeah. I want this tub for sure. I love this thing. Love the house this me. is wild. So we, we go to Portugal. We have to find the exact piece of stone. We always use Is that this. a single piece of stone? Yeah. I guess it has to be, right? Uh, I is mean, it marble? Yeah, I think it's marble. It's, a big it's block Pele de Tigre, which is, it comes from, uh, our friend has a quarry there, actually, that is super deep and really amazing. And, um, and it all has this, uh, we love this stone because the grain continues through mm -hmm. the form. Mm -hmm, um, right. And I, I love to see what character the stone had originally. If it's all white, you don't get to see that anymore. Um, and there's a bit of a surprise because you don't know what vein you're going to uncover, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, we, you can kind of get it from looking uh, from the outside of the block, but uh -huh. you're not really sure. Um, and this is, uh, this is a, a, it, in the formal series is something we call Zoidberg which is based on Dr. Zoidberg from uh, the cartoon show Futurama. Okay. Because uh, he has like little... Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> don't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> we watched it as kids yeah. and we're obsessed with it. Uh, and <laughs> so, uh, really, like, it's about feeling the stone. So when you, when you walk up to this thing, you kind of have to touch it. And those knobs are very... Uh, the scale is very touchable. Right. Uh, and the stone is also... Um, it's honed. We never polish it. Uh, so it has so kind of a skin. Super smooth, yeah. yeah it feels yeah. a little like skin, which yeah. is it's very sensual. And uh -huh. um, uh, we just, you know, stone was our first medium. So we kind of started going back to, to that and seeing how we would do it differently. It reminds me, now that I'm looking at it, it reminds me of that famous photograph by Harold Edgerton of the milk drop that yeah, pops it's like up a little like droplet. A little crown. So <laughs> But it's totally but weird. And then this is a totally different category. Yeah. This is Dr. Seuss to me. Very. Yeah. So also growing up in Texas, roadkill was a big theme. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, taxidermy I, and roadkill. Uh huh. Yeah. And I wanted to make roadkill of, of <laughs> extinct, uh, like extinct <laughs> animal pelts. I don't know. Um, <laughs> But again, <laughs> wacky. The one that's not an extinct animal is is uh, the rainbow zebra, which is um, uh, it's based on the fruit stripe gum no, zebra. No, yeah, uh huh. Uh, so <laughs> it was like we we hunted the the fruit stripe right. gum zebra. And these are actual rugs that you can walk on, right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're meant to be used. Uh, you can yeah. put it on the wall or on the ground, mm -hmm. and they're they're all um, it's hand knotted. Uh, they're Nepalese, and uh, we went to Nepal and and worked on right. them there. Um, and so it's a it's a dodo, a thylacine, a some kind of cat whose name I don't remember okay. that's extinct, and a and a mammoth, and then the fruit stripe zebra. Why don't you talk a bit about your collaborations? Because you've done it with these, and you did it with the beadwork. Yeah. Maybe we can. I'm gonna find the beadwork. This okay. Because I want to get to that. There's the oh, there's a good example oh, yeah, of a close up of that technique where you can see how they they hug the surface in that insane exactly. way. Exactly. It's really amazing. Um, here's beadwork. Right? Yes. So, so that's, your, that's your current obsession. You yeah, yeah, and that's been going on for a while now. So we went to Cape Town, and we're uh, just walking around a design fair. And we met a, um, we met a collective that does beadwork. Uh, and they, uh, they were really cool. We Did you go to Cape Town specifically to look for people to No, we went with, to or? do a talk, actually. So, okay. And then we just were wandering around. Um, and when I went in, I was like, wow, these pieces are... Uh, they take probably just as long as, as our work does, and they're animals, and they're incredible. Actually, one of the pieces that was in there was um, uh, this uh, many-horned antelope thing from Princess Mononoke, and I recognized that, and I was like, wow, it's crazy. This weird uh, cultural reference has shown up in, in like a traditional craft. Uh -huh. um, and I just love craft so much, and I think that beadwork is one that gets overlooked really often. I think basket weaving is another one. Mm -hmm. Any kind of hand-done weaving mm -hmm. gets really overlooked, so I get super excited about getting to dive into something like that. Um, so we, uh, we, did, we asked if they would want to work with us, 
and spent six months uh, going back and forth with them, uh, going back and forth to Cape Town, working closely with them. They taught me how to bead. We would all draw together. What does um, it mean to, if they teach you how to bead? Like, what's the actual, what does that, does it mean you're stringing little glass beads on a string? Yeah, literally? one by one. One by one, okay. They use a chain stitch that has, the, like, two or three beads on it, and they're mm -hmm. all next to each other. Uh, there's the, many ways to do it, but um, uh, this is, it's incredible. Their, their method is super expressive, and, um, and it was exciting for us. We hadn't used much color until this, and they sort of, like, introduced us to color, and um, it's, a, it's the two of us and then a group of 25 women, mm -hmm. uh, and we showed this collection at the Cooper Hewitt, um, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, the idea was to, to do transgressive design, and for us, it's uh, obviously not functional, but we would take these uh, mushrooms and call them umbrellas, for example, in order to get them into a design fair. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so right, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> or if you call that thing a toy, Right. Uh, then uh -huh. it has a function. Uh -huh. So that's something we play with too. Um, right. But uh, this is uh, this was a really life changing project, and it's gotten me completely obsessed with beads. Um, and uh, we still are doing it. Actually, we're going to be showing some new works like this in September in New York, uh, which I'm excited for. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, it just changed our lives because we'd never gone to somewhere like Cape Town. It's a really intense place. There's a lot of sad things happening. Uh, <clears throat> we thought that the way they were making money was um, not great, like the amount of money they made for the pieces that took as long and were as great as ours. Uh, they were not making nearly as much. And uh, so we set up a, like a whole profit sharing system and it, it's a completely different kind of, um, for us it was uh, like a, kind of an experiment in how to do business also. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's important that makers, A, get credit, because I'm not the only one who makes my work, uh, and B, are paid really well for it. Um, so this was kind of our first uh, step in that direction. Um, so the collaboration was like, you, you felt like you were taking their, you were, they were helping you like move your own work with their tradition that they oh, completely. infused you with. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was, it's, it's, uh, it was equally, it's equally us and them as far as the aesthetic goes. Right. Um, and you wouldn't have no idea uh, which part came from who, whom. And I think that that's kind of awesome. Um, and when we showed this at the Cooper Hewitt, it was just a list of all of our names. Like, it wasn't the right. Haas Brothers. Right. So, I mean, it, now it kind of happens, uh, though I wish that it was just... Uh, that list, uh, and so that was something that we were sort of ex like experimenting with, and we've actually now taken this because I became so obsessed with beads. We're doing a really similar project in uh, Central California, where I go and teach bead work um, to women in uh, farming communities where work is pretty scarce uh, for women in particular. And um, so I teach them beading, and then we start working together, and we have a whole collection of that coming out also. That's great. So I imagine it brings me to the point of art and craft and the difference or not difference. And I imagine you don't care, and you probably don't see a difference. You know? I don't care, yeah. except for how people categorize right. them. Yeah. Uh, I don't like that there's a hierarchy there. Right. Uh, and that's something that started for me when I was at RISD, and I was studying painting that, you know, that a portrait is somehow above a still life. Right. Uh, that a history right. painting is yeah, really special. Well, yeah. When I found them so boring. I think actually. we're done with that. Hopefully we're <laughs> yeah. done with that. Yeah. But, but that's like a natural, um, that's sort still, of something I mean, that it is art. Do. It is art history to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I never was into that. I don't think drawings are any less than a painting. Right. Uh, and... I don't really think that something you live with, like design, is somehow less than a piece of art either. Uh, it's just how much do you focus on function or not. Um, and I think craft gets the, the real, like, gets kicked to the side uh, all the time, when in truth, it's sort of why we're here. I mean, without baskets and pottery, right. we wouldn't be here. Right. Uh, so I think it's, it's part of... And you know, without technology, well, that's and, and so designed. functional things have always been the carriers of art. And they, yeah. I think it's just part of human culture. As soon as they made up something to make, 
you know, something to cook with. They yeah. s they decorated it with a line or something. Yeah, maybe you know, there's so. maybe there's not an emotional impact when you see it, but for me, there is when I see design works. There's an emotional right. impact, um, and uh, I think I think the two go hand in hand. They're super important. Craft is really to me like the most important one. Well, people, it's uh, interesting when you because people will talk about high art. You know, you talk about a great painter or something having a great craft. You may yeah. have great technique, and it's not a dirty word in that. Instance, and yeah. I mean, it's not. A, I don't. I think people, you know, they create those boundaries themselves in their heads. So Definitely, to, to like they do a lot of things. But. Yeah, and like, I'm sure, it's easy to to fetishize a painter sitting alone and right. doing his thing. And right. I, I get that, but but that's but, not the only way to. But make there art. are many painters, yeah. many famous artists in art history who had huge studios, and, yeah. and art's always been about production and business in a lot of in many cultures. Exactly, not every culture, but. And I mean, I, I might be wrong about the exact origins of this, but I think about beads and how they are, how they were an abacus, that that's a, mm -hmm. basically a calculator, right, that's right, beads. Right, right, right. Beads were, um, they were currency at one point. Right. I think that the jacquard loom was like the earliest computer. I'm sure I'm wrong about that fact, but I know that it's a very early computer. So weaving was actually like a form of computing. Um, it's a mind-body connection. It's what your hands can do with a material. Yeah, exactly. Your mind manipulates that. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>